for on. My name is Ruth Cowles. I am a librarian here at the Portage District Library. I work in the adult department, so I'm usually upstairs. If you ever see me, that's where you're probably going to see me. Uh, I would like to put down some rules so that we're all on the same page tonight. So when we get to question and answer period, this mic has to be in front of you before you answer the question, because otherwise the people at home can't hear you. And then they are like, what did they ask? So just to help that, we are live streaming this on YouTube tonight as well. So hopefully we've got some people at home looking at this. And uh, I'm not going to introduce Jerry because Steve does a much better job at introducing people than I do. While you're here, please make sure you check out our other events that we have going on at the library. We have a couple of calendars upstairs and some handouts before you go. Also, if you enjoy tonight and would like to see more things like this, we have a survey all the way down on the wall down there. Before you leave, fill out a survey so you can let my bosses know that you enjoy this. And then obviously we'll have Jerry back, so. <laughs> All right, Steve, are you ready? Are you ready? Yeah, I'm good, whenever okay. you are. I'm always good to talk about history. Ruth and I partnered on this, so that's why I get to introduce. She gives the instructions, I get to introduce. So um, my name's Steve Rossio, and I'm also a librarian here at the Portage Library. I run the uh, history room upstairs, so that's where you'll find me most of the time, and then I'm also involved in youth programming and so forth and so on, so you may see me there. And it is my pleasure, well, I, I, maybe I should read this. Good evening. Uh, it is my pleasure, actually it says, we are excited to have Jerry Berg introduce us to Viking combat. So. I didn't know that's what you were doing. Oh, that's yeah. amazing. I should have read this beforehand. Uh, Jerry is the founder of the Swordsmanship Museum and Academy located in Comstock Park. And they do have a website. So if you are interested in more of what he does, check out the website. Am I correct on, on that as far as? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, sure. it's amazing. Um, the Academy offers classes and weekly clubs. Jerry has covered other topics for the library over the years and has a few videos on our YouTube channel that you can also check out if you are interested. And we will surely see Jerry's passion for history and combat as he brings Vikings to light tonight. And in just speaking with him, I can tell you that you will not be disappointed. So everybody, it's my pleasure to present Jerry Berg. I'm gonna self-promote for just a quick second too. If you like the Viking combat aspect of what we're about to talk about today and want to know more, we have a Viking combat curriculum for adults uh, starting in April, like really soon, in Caledonia. I think it's April 11th, but you'll have to check the website for that. So, hooray, cool stuff. Hi, everyone. I'm Hi. Awesome. The one at Caledonia is $79. That is four sessions of two hours each, so eight hours for just under 80 bucks. And we provide everything, except for athletic cups if you're a guy. We don't, we don't provide loaner gear for that. So uh, let me do a quick introduction. Swordsmanship Museum and Academy. Yeah, it's pretty sick. It's pretty cool. Uh, there's more to it than that. We're, we're way deeper than just, yeah, swords. Don't get, don't get me wrong. That is definitely true. But also, there's something more to it. If you go to a park, just picture yourself at a, at a park. There's kids playing. One of those kids happens to pick up a stick. That stick could be anything. It could be a fishing pole. It could be a magic wand. It could be a conductor's baton. But 100% of the time, what is it? Right on. <laughs> And, that, and so that just shows that we just have this, we, humans, we have this curiosity about swords. We have this innate interest and curiosity. What was it like to fight with one of these? What made someone go mano a mano with someone right in front of them and decide to cut them down? What would make them so passionate to do something like that? And you know what? That's a really good question to ask. And it's still one that you can't answer, uh, not, not very easily but we are using that natural curiosity about swords as a vehicle to teach about greater history and greater culture and the struggles of humanity. And yeah, swords, yeah. So that's what, that's what we're all about today. And we're also very dedicated to fact. 
historical research, scholarly and archaeological stuff. And I know there's someone out there who's going, Ugh, I don't want that. I want Viking face paint. So one of the things the museum does is we do living, histor living history events or reenactments. And we do reenactments from all the different eras, so many of them. We reenact, uh, for example, modern stuff like Lumberjacks of Michigan or Civil War soldiers, as well as doing some really niche things like 16th century Irish rebels um, and, of course, Vikings. In no other era aside from Vikings do I get some weird stuff. I don't know why. I don't want to dive into why, but uh, I'll tell you a story recently. We were, at a, we were at an event recently in Michigan, a Viking event, uh, and there's multiple groups that claim to be reenactors there. Uh, and you know, I'm friends with these people who just happen to like me on Facebook, and I made the mistake before this event of saying, here's how to reenact as a Viking. And I was a little grumpy. I said stuff like, don't wear fur, don't have face paint, uh, don't use two-handed swords, don't go into a battle rage, you know, and, and stuff like that. You know, these, these are humans, these are people. Uh, and apparently, <laughs> that upset someone who ran one of these groups. And I'm, I'm a nice guy, you know, I understand if I upset someone. So at this event, I, I went up to them, and here they are with horns and face paint and fur draped over their shoulders. And I said, hey, I'm so sorry if I upset you. I, I really, you know, we, we do different things. I understand no, no one should feel bad about something that makes them feel good. Um, and they said, yes, I completely understand. And you know what? The way that we represent being heathens, it, it's more about a feeling than it is about research. I have never bit my tongue harder in my life because all of this archaeological survey research, all of these nonfiction works written by qualified archaeologists and historians can't get superseded by a feeling. Uh, so that's what we're about. We are about focusing on the history uh, because when you get to other eras, you don't see, for example, you go to a Civil War reenactment and you don't see Union soldiers putting like battle face paint on their face. You know, because we have the history. That was only 150-ish years ago. We have diaries and we have military reports and we have just a chunk of the library that's dedicated to Civil War research. Just, right? <laughs> the Civil War reenactor slash librarian's like, uh-huh. Uh, I've read all of it. But when we get to Vikings, these guys were not what we'd expect. The Viking Age was roughly, very, and I say roughly because I don't want to talk about it too much, roughly a thousand years ago. And this was a culture that they did have a written language, but they really didn't use it. Their, their written language was used on, on rune stones that say things like, Sven was here, you know? Um, so we don't have that kind of like, here's how I live my life. There is no Viking diary and he explored all of his raids and attacks and things that he did. It, 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 we just, we have speculation. And I'm gonna talk to you guys a little bit about that before we dive in, because I wanna set the stage about what it is that we're learning and how we have this knowledge. But I also wanna let you know, I love it when my presentations are interactive. If you have a question about anything that pops up at any point, yes, we will have Q&A session at the end too, but at any point during the presentation, if you are curious about something I say, pull a first grader, you know, hand up, and if I don't pick on you, you know, just hold your shoulder, hold your elbow up like a tired first grader, okay? I will call you because I prefer to answer your question than to do my little presentation here because that means you're curious. And chances are someone else is also curious about that, and I want to answer that. Sound good? Yep. Any questions? <laughs> Furls? Um, is there any uh, thing that in the written language uh, someone said frick you? You know what? I'm very glad you asked that. I'm very glad you asked that. Oh, I'll, I'll re. Oh, I can replay. Okay. No, 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 no. 
Okay. Ask it again, Zoe. Do it. <laughs> Come there, on. What are you is, worried about? Is there any uh, specific way, like the Viking said, to their enemies and just frig you and then throw the stone? <laughs> there is. There is. Sort of. And I cannot let you guys know the importance of graffiti in historical research. We didn't know who the uh, Great Pyramid of Giza was, if, was for if it weren't for a piece of graffiti. And to bring it to the Vikings, the grandest mosque slash religious building ever, the Hagia Sophia, uh, has a little piece of graffiti that literally says, I can't remember the name of the guy, but it, that's why I said Sven was here earlier, because it literally says that. <laughs> Carved into this giant religious building, and a Viking had traveled down and used his runic knowledge to carve graffiti. Yay! So let's talk about what we do know. I talked about how the Civil War, for example, has lots of documents. Viking Age does not. The Viking Age has three sources of information for how we know about Vikings. One, the Vi I already said the Vikings didn't write about themselves, but there are other people who wrote about Vikings. Uh, one, for example, is an uh, Islamic chronicler called Ibn Fadlan. Ibn Fadlan uh, came across a group of Viking traders on one of the eastern European rivers and followed them and wrote down some of their rituals uh, and their, their, their lives. And we're like, oh, that's pretty cool. Um, and then he writes really bad things about the Vikings. Really bad. Uh, if you want to know some of these bad things, come to one of my presentations at an establishment that sells alcohol. But uh, I'm not going to do it here. <laughs> he does write that they were slave traders uh, and that they were some of the dirtiest and smelliest people on the planet. That is, of course, very contradictory to an Anglo-Saxon document that says that the Vikings are stealing all of their women because they are the cleanest people on the planet. Hooray! We, we, have, we love contradictions in our primary sources. Uh, but the point is, this was not a Viking writing about Viking lives. And when I say Viking, I should clarify, I mean medieval Scandinavians. If you ever hear someone say, a oh, Viking was an occupation, not a culture, you say, I know, and then spit in their face. It's fine. Call them a nerd. Uh, <laughs> question. I think the women were more protected of them because of their Scottish accents. Oh boy, we'll talk about Scottish accents and Vikings. Uh, well, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> For now, I do want to say that the primary sources written by non-Vikings about Vikings are usually not perfect. Usually take it with a big old grain of salt because half the time they were uh, talking about someone who has been literally terrorizing their land for decades, uh, or possibly uh, there's a little bit of religious conflict in their descriptions of people from their, a, a, a religious group that is not their own. So we'll throw that out for a minute. We have another source of information. Have you guys heard about the Viking sagas? Yeah, saga is such a cool word. They use it in Dragon Ball Z. It's great. No one? Jeez, tough crowd. Uh, in any case, the sagas are a collection of literally, I mean, just the, if, you, if you go by pages, there are thousands of pages of stories written by Scandinavians about Viking history, usually family history, usually talking about, okay, this family or this group of people performed this act and performed this act, and you go, wow, this is so cool. When was this written again? And you realize these Scandinavians who wrote the sagas wrote them a minimum of about 300 years after the end of the Viking Age. That would be even worse than if someone were to be playing a video game about World War I today and then go, aha, I know about World War I history. So as disappointing as it is, much of the sagas have to be thrown out uh, in terms of scholarly history. There's actually a big debate about whether or not we should do it because there is some stuff that's archaeologically confirmed. For example, the saga of Eric the Red and the saga of the of Vinland saga uh, talks about the colonizing of this crazy place that they call Vinland. And then lo and behold, 
We find uh, archaeological sites in North Canada, Newfoundland, that sh lines up with the Vinland sagas. And you go, oh, okay, well, if we find a Viking village here, maybe the Vinland saga makes sense, um, which is the Viking discovery of America, which is pretty cool, honestly. Um, but then you get sagas where you're like, okay, a giant bestial evil wolf came and devoured someone's family in the middle of the night, and another person threw a spear and then leapt upon that spear and rode it to his enemy. I will not be recreating that. <laughs> so we'll throw those out. So we got rid of the two out of the three sources of information about the Vikings. The third one is my favorite. Oh, oh I love it. It's the A word, archaeology. This is cool because it's the least biased, most objective form of, of historical knowledge. And what this is, is digging in the ground, the loamy soil or the, or the bogs, and pulling out a physical item that was used by medieval Scandinavians, by Vikings. And we have tons of these, tons and tons of these bits of information. Most of them are metal. And yeah, yeah, swords and spears are metal too, which is where we get this cool stuff, and we'll talk about that. But you know, there's a ton of other stuff too. There's a ton of things like jewelry and other artistic pieces. And that's really neat because using these artistic pieces, these brooches and these rings and these necklaces and pendants, we can tell how far, because they had a very, very specific, very iconic Viking or Scandinavian style art, we can tell just how far these guys traveled. We find these pieces in Ireland, in Greenland, in the New World. We find them in Spain. We find them in North Africa. We find them in the Byzantine Empire out far east. These guys, these Vikings were so far spread, they were all over Europe, all over other parts of the, or other continents, not all over, North Africa, for example, Western Asia, North America. That is why this age is called the Viking Age. Because, not because the Vikings colonized or ruled everyone, but because they were everywhere and they influenced the culture so much. The Viking Age. I'm going to get to our first weapon. Bear with me. I know why you're here. Just got to let you know we're historians here. The Viking Age started because scientists and historians really like putting set dates on things. We say it started in 793 at the raid at Lindisfarne. Lindisfarne, or specifically the cathedral at Lindisfarne, is the first documented raid performed by Norm Northmen's. Uh, Northmen, or Vikings as we call it. Uh, what Lindisfarne was, a cathedral, a Christian cathedral. Um, and just to, just to explain it for a second, cathedrals or monasteries, I've been saying cathedral, I mean to say monastery, monastery at Lindisfarne. Monasteries are places where monks live, and anyone who lives in the local region who wants to pay their religious dues or taxes or what have you will pay it to the monastery and no one dares take from the monastery because if you take from the monastery, your eternal soul is sent down for damnation. Uh, so no one takes it. But you want to know who doesn't care about that? The Vikings. <laughs> the Vikings. Because they were not, at this point in 793, they were not Christian. And they said, wow, look at that really cool building that has tons of gold. Wow, what, what do we do about those bald guys who are living there? You know, are they going to fight back? No. You say? And the Vikings, this, this raid at Lindisfarne, they, they go and they, you know, they knock on the door and they chop a few heads and then they carry a whole bunch of wealth back to Scandinavia. And this concept spreads. The, this is not, we are, we are not talking about kingdoms yet in Scandinavia. We're talking about little petty chieftains, little, little regions, if you will. And this concept of like, oh, did you hear about that clan, you know, Five miles down the, down the coast, they, they sent a raiding party over to Anglo-Saxon England, came back with a ton of wealth, and now they're buying everything they can find and dressing fancy and wearing all this cool jewelry. Maybe, maybe, maybe we should do that. 
And that happens, and that happens, that happens, that happens, it keeps going, and suddenly raiding becomes the name of the game. It is something that you have to do to survive, it's something you have to do to uh, keep your citizens and your people and your population happy, and it becomes the cultural identity of Scandinavia in the Viking Age. And it's not because of their brutality or their, uh, or their ability to chop heads without caring. It comes from one specific military technology that I cannot fit here in this room. One piece, anyone want to take a guess of what I'm about to talk about? Boom, right here, the Viking longboat, or if you want to be super edgy, call it a dragon ship. <laughs> Don't call it a dragon ship. Longboat, longship, whatever you want to call it. Now, this is cool. This is a boat, okay? It's not a sword or an ax or anything, it's a boat. What makes it so special is that the Viking longship is constructed very quickly, very cheaply. You do not have to have a specialized skill. You just have to have lots of wood, which is great for Scandinavia. They would make a frame, like a skeleton of the ship with solid pieces and a bow that goes all the way across from the front to end. And then they would just take planks of wood and slap it on the side, nail it in place, and there's a ton of holes in that. So all you do is you take a bunch of fabric that is tarred, covered in, covered in black pitch, and just jam it up in between the planks of that ship. It is not pretty. It is not a specialized way of making a ship, but they did it, and what makes it so special is the long ship is the first recorded ship that is able to have a heavy load, a heavy weight. This can be men, uh, warriors, raiders. It can also be the goods and the gold and the precious metals that you have just taken from a town. And no matter the weight on it, it does not have a deep draft. What, the, what a draft is, is that when you have a ship on the ocean, part of that ship is underwater. The giant tall ships that you see 700 years after the Viking Age, they have two or three levels under the water because it's a massive amount of wood and weight that goes in there. But the design of the Viking longship does not sink deep in the water. It stays fairly high. If you're building a city, a settlement, and you want it to be defended against any potential attackers, and you don't want to waste your resources on like outposts or walls or fortifications completely surrounding your village, you'd build it on a river. Go to, go to the Grand River. What river do you guys have down here? Other river. That makes sense. Go to the Kalamazoo River. And imagine you didn't have bridges or industry, didn't have jetpacks, and just think, how am I going to cross that? You're not going to be able to. So you build your city on one side of it, and you don't have to worry about half your town. This thing that previously was a literal fortification, natural fortification, is now a freeway for Viking raiding parties to travel right into the middle of your town, take your stuff, grab it, and get the heck out of there before the actual military forces can, can arrive. Makes a lot of sense. Let's talk about Viking armor for a second. I'm doing this out of order, doing this out of order. I, I, I usually save armor for the last, but I'm trying something new. Oh, geez, I can hear my voice. Ooh. This, right here. Can you guys back there see it? Probably not too well. Sorry. This is a Viking helmet. Actually, it's Viking Age helmet. If I really wanted to get nerdy about it, it's called a Norman helmet. It's a nasal helm because this little piece here goes down over your nose. It was a very common helmet in the Viking Age, especially used by non-Viking warriors. Uh, there's also another helmet that I don't have a good replica of. In fact, I have a lingering remnant from when I was poor and cheap and got this really gross looking one, so I don't bring it out. Uh, but it's called an ocular helmet or a Yermundbu helmet based on the archaeological find. And it, it looks like this, but instead of just the nose piece, it has a couple pieces coming down here. Uh, why it gets its name, ocular helmet. Looks like you're looking through some some uh, glasses. Pretty cool, pretty cool. It's fairly heavy, but not too heavy. I mean, you know, I can still run in this, especially if it's trapped on my head. Uh, but archaeologically, how many, so archaeologically, how many, how many complete Viking Age helmets 
in the entirety of Scandinavia, which encompasses three modern day countries, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, and the entire 300 year Viking age, how many helmets, complete Viking helmets, do you think archeologists have pulled up uh, over the years? Guess, what have you got? Three million's a very good guess, because there's plenty of Vikings in that age, especially over 300 years. Another guess, what have you got? 1,000 is also a very good guess. That's, that's also a very good guess. Let me, let me tell you the actual answer of how many complete Viking helmets archaeologists have found over the years. One. 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 One helmet over the region of three nations. We have, we have not found any of these in Viking Age Scandinavia. It's a, this is not it. I am, I am not that wealthy, and I am not yet a supervillain. <laughs> So let's, okay, okay, well, okay, well, let's take a break from the helmets for a second. Let's take a look at this guy. This, oh jeez, voice. This, I'm not gonna pick it up. This is a hauberk of a type of armor referred to as chain mail. Chain mail's cool because it's made of these little rings that are interwoven and it makes this malleable, movable metal. It's very cool, very good for defending yourself against cutting not very good against blunt, that's really going to stop a, a hammer from hurting you, but it's very good at stopping cuts and moderately good at stopping stabs. Uh, okay, it's also heavy. It's about 25 pounds if you have a full thing, full thing with a, with a coif, the thing over your head. Question, how many full, complete hauberks <laughs> do you think archaeologists have found over the years? Good guesses, guys. One, actually, there's a second one currently being debated. They found it in a literal, like, melded together chunk at the bottom of a lake in, in Poland, right on the Scandinavian border, and people think it's a Viking chain mail. It's currently being analyzed. But other than that, one. One. What conclusion do we have to draw as proper scientific research-based historians if we have found one helmet and one chainmail suit? What have you got? Good guess, because they pro they, there's definitely a chance. I mean, armor rusts, it gets wet, it eats away. But I mean, we have plenty of armor from the Roman era, we have plenty of armor from the regions, the times before the Viking Age, after the Viking Age. It might not be the best conclusion. Thought? Um, they might be lost and or forgotten. That's a good question too. Lost or forgotten? You maybe reused it? What have you got, sir? They weren't thinking about putting it in a museum. They're thinking about repurposing it. That's good too. That's also good. There's plenty of reuse. I mean, World War I, you have so many just artifacts getting melted down to be made into, into weapons. I'm going to tell you what it is. You're going to hate me for it. Vikings didn't wear much armor. These guys were raiders. Raiders. They are good at running away. You want to know what is not good at running? Boom! <laughs> that stuff. I'm intentionally not wearing that right now because it's heavy. Uh, and it makes sense because these guys were raiders. They were raiders. They run in, they murder a couple <laughs> people. Uh, and grab everything that they think is valuable, be it chests of gold, be it chandeliers, silverware, human beings, and they take it back on their ship. Yes, Vikings were horrible slave traders. I want to clarify that. They are not good people. And they take it back on their longship, take it back home, and voila, they're wealthy. And no armor. Asterisk. There are plenty of Viking warrior societies, societies within Viking medieval Scandinavia that were focused on warfare and combat, and yes, those guys almost certainly wore armor. But your average Viking was not. Your average Viking was not a warrior. Your average Viking had one main job, and it was not raiding. Anyone want to take a guess what the Viking's main job was? Your average job in medieval Scandinavia? Yes, ma'am? No, it was not that, as disappointing as I am. Yes, sir? Good guess, but also definitely not. Ma'am? Farming? 
farming. You gotta eat. You gotta live. You, you can't eat gold. You can't eat silver. You have to grow. You have to farm things. And most Vikings, aka medieval Scandinavians, were farmers. Here's a very rough layout of how their year goes. Remember, this is the, this is the time before scientific agriculture. This is before the constant, annual, nearly nonstop care for the ground and the land. There's no crop rotation. There's no fertilizer. Here's the rough layout of how Viking farming goes. The snow melts. You have your fresh spring. You throw your seeds down, and you wait for the plants to grow. You wait, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait. Oh, look, and now my plants are, are grown. Gourds and not gourds. That's a new world thing. My grain. My grain has grown. I harvest the grain, and then winter hits. And you wait, 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 and you wait. And then spring comes back, and you throw your seeds down. And you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait. And it repeats over and over and over again. And all of a sudden, these crazy guys come back from Lindisfarne, looking really good with their new wealth. And you go, hey, when did you have time for that? All we're doing is waiting around here. These Viking raiders had plenty of time to go on raids. And that's when they did it, in the off time of their farming, of their crops. So there probably was one dude on a Viking raid who had armor, probably. And his role was the herser. The herser is the, the guy who's kind of your professional raider. He learns where the weak spots are. He learns where the wealth is located outside of Scandinavia. And he gathers together as many of these farmers as he can to go on a raiding party. And he says, hey, guys, we're going to raid in like three months. I got this really cool cathedral. The monks are really squishy. All right? We're going to take care of this. Grab your weapons and meet me at the longship at this time. And the farmer goes, OK. And they show up. And the Viking farmer does not really have weapons per se, but he does have tools on the farm. And many of those tools are these. Viking axes. Very, very cool, very, very useful. This head is hopefully well attached. I'm swinging it around. So this is the main weapon of the Vikings, not because it's brutal and terrifying, but because this is what they had. It's not very expensive because metal was very expensive at the time. I won't really dive into the whole story of fingering your way through bog to find this gross rock that you can take to a smith and he'll heat it up and it turns into metal somehow magically. It's expensive and rare. They didn't have pit mining or shaft mining. They had finger mining. <laughs> and they would have axes, not a lot of metal, tons of wood. Cool, makes sense. The weight is all at the top, which makes it very good for swinging around, makes it very good for multiplying your strength when you hit a target, and very good at doing things around the farm, like cutting down small trees, decapitating chickens. Um, and there's one other cool thing, and I'm going to tell you two stories about it. You might, this has a small example of it. I'm going to show you a really embellished version of it. This. This is an embellished version of what we like to call. He'll say, oh yeah, the bearded ax is really good because it's good for hooking your enemy's weapon and getting it out of the way, or hooking their shield and pulling it down so you can get to the soft body behind the shield, which is technically true, but that probably was incidental rather than the reason for creating bearded axes. A bearded ax was likely created not for that battlefield stuff, but because it was useful on the farm. If you have, one, this whole chunk that could have been expensive metal is now very free air. But also, if you're doing things like barking logs or scraping uh, f uh, flesh and fat off of, a, off of a skin of an animal to turn into leather, it makes a lot more sense to grasp the ax behind the blade so that you have much more control over the blade than if you were to hold it here and you kind of have this weird angle weight leverage thing. So it's pretty cool. I like that. But as the years continue, Vikings are now seen as terrifying 
fighters. They just their presence scares people because they're they're raiders. You could it doesn't matter where you live in Europe. You could live in the Carolingian Empire, you could live in the Byzantine Empire, you could you could live in some random place, some random Polish chieftain's land. You are not safe from a potential Viking raid. And so if you are at war and you hire Vikings to fight for you as mercenaries, they are going to increase your ability to terrify your opponent immensely. And the Vikings take this axe culture and adopt it on the battlefield to create this. This is your Viking heavy weapon. And I want to clarify, there were no two-handed swords in the Viking Age. Okay, Conan the Barbarian was fantasy. This is referred to as a Dane axe. And at this time, by the way, Danes were referring to any Scandinavian, any Viking. So Viking axe, it's really cool. This is a heavy weapon. I want to clarify, if you look down the blade, it's not very thin, right? Or I'm sorry, let me say that again. It's not very thick, not very thick. It's not very thick, especially compared to that little hand axe I had earlier. It's because the things that you are going to be chopping with this are soft and squishy. People. This is a people chopping axe. And that means it is an axe not to be used on the farm, not to be taken on a raid, but for used in battle. This is your Viking battle axe which I think is cool, because it shows the Viking axe culture, the raid culture, actually influenced other aspects of Viking life. If I have time, I'll tell you about how we use this. Hey, yeah, I'll tell you how I use it. Okay, I like it. Axes, it'll be the last axe topic, and then we'll talk, uh, talk about other things. Axes, how do we use these? In the Swordsmanship Museum and Academy, most of our classes are historical swordsmanship, and we know how to do that because when people knew how to write and when people knew how to use swords, they usually fused them together and wrote a manual on how to perform swordsmanship, which is cool. We've got surviving books from as far back as the 1300s telling you it is literally a step-by-step -step guide on how to sword fight. That's cool. None of these YouTube people or sword expert explains why this video game is wrong. It's like, you don't need to listen to that. We have literally the book. But you want to know who didn't like to write things down? The Vikings, yes. They like, they like poetry, and that's about it. So we have to interpret. How do we interpret how to use the Dane axe? Well, there's a couple methods to do it. One I like to call reverse compatible swordsmanship where we look at the role of this weapon, or the size or shape of this weapon, and we see if there's a, a, a similar weapon in the future that they did write a book on. Uh, and they did, in fact. There's a weapon called a great sword that was popular in the 1500s, 1600s. This is a six foot tall sword, and it likely had a very similar use. So if we were to compare that, oh geez, you know what, I'm just gonna, there, pretend this has an ax head on it. So as you, I really like that I have a lot of space, but low ceilings, sorry. So as you're on the battlefield, you could be using your Dane Axe like a great sword, and you are using it as area denial. What that means is, if you have an allied troop on the battlefield, and for whatever reason they're tired, say they got in a little skirmish, they're exhausted, they ran here, they're tired, whatever it might be, they need a moment to recuperate, because if they get in a battle with an enemy troop, they will lose, because they're tired. Uh-oh, what's that over there? It's an enemy troop. Whoops, <laughs> they're charging right for you. So a good commander will tell all your Dane Axemen, hey, don't let them get close. We're going to go this way. You guys stay here and don't let them touch us. And the Dane Axeman says, will you pay me twice as much? And the guy says, yeah, okay, sure. If you come back alive, I'll pay you twice as much. He says, okay. And take their Dane Axe, which you pretend will have a head on it, and they will start swinging it around like this, I'm gonna go very slow, and if your torso gets tired, or if your arms get tired, you'll just spin around for a quick second, and keep that momentum going. You can even go the opposite direction. Woohoo! spinning, it's beautiful. And you know, if I'm doing this, you notice I'm not lopping anyone's head off right now, and if I were on the battlefield doing this properly, 
I wouldn't be lopping anyone's head off then either. Because if I'm doing this properly, they're all too scared to get even close to me. I have turned myself into a big old blender on the battlefield. And ain't no one wants a Dane axe going like this to go into their skull. That is area denial. I've turned myself into an obstacle to allow the enemy, or to allow my allied troops to escape the enemy, giving them extra time. Cool stuff. That's backwards compatible swordsmanship. I like archeological swordsmanship. Looking at primary sources, looking at the information we have, and there is a one really good surviving document that we refer to as the Boyo Tapestry. The Boyo Tapestry de describes the Battle of Hastings, which is in the year 1066, the last year of the Viking Age, even though it extended a little bit farther than that, and it does not show Vikings at all. What it shows are Anglo-Saxons, which were very influenced by Viking culture, fighting against Normans, who were very influenced by Viking culture, but neither were Vikings but it does show Dane axes. And it shows cool things. It shows guys leaning on their Dane axes like this so we know how tall they are, which is, which is actually an archaeological difficulty. We don't have a lot of surviving Dane axes with the shaft attached. Metal survives well a thousand years. Wood doesn't. So we know how tall they are, but then we look at the depictions of the Dane axe being used in battle, and the Dane axemen are fighting against one particular type of enemy almost exclusively when they're being used in battle. One type of enemy, think about it for a second. On the medieval battlefield, there's one type of enemy that a Dane Axe would do well at. Any suggestions? Horse, cavalry, proto-knights. This, this is an anti-cavalry, anti-horse weapon. That's pretty cool. And theoretically, I mean, they, they show them in all sorts of angles. They show them chopping downward on a horse's head or from below coming above. But theoretically, when you are facing down a horse, first of all, you have to have some super guts to be able to stand in a charging horse's way. I am terrified of horses for good reason. But theoretically, if you, will, if you would have your ax held low, this is going to fall off, there it is, held low, and you stand there waiting for the horse, what you could do, their horse is, is just an animal. They're, they're not like bloodthirsty or anything. They're just following the commands of the rider. And if the rider's in full rush, charging down the battlefield, he cannot control the horse, you know, last second. So you will supposedly, theoretically, step out of the way in the last second for that horse. The horse is still charging at me here. But if I step like this, I am technically just out of the path of the horse. But my axe isn't. And as the horse continues on his ride, I will bring the axe up and the two speeding things, my axe head going like this and the horse coming the opposite direction will cross paths. And uh, you earn your money as a warrior. And there's no longer a horse. Then you can get the rider. He's not really good when he's fallen off of a one ton animal. So Dane axes the ultimate battlefield weapon for specialist troops. But let's talk about other non-axe weapons for a second. <laughs> I've only got 15 minutes. <laughs> That's great. The most overlooked and underappreciated weapon of all time, the spear. Anyone play Skyrim out there? Thank you. I didn't like it. Actually, I loved it. <laughs> but there's one aspect I didn't like. No spears. I had to download a mod for spears. It wasn't good. All I need is a chuckle. It's great. <laughs> because this, this weapon is the dominant weapon of every battlefield for the majority of human history. And what is a gun if not a spear that can go extra far? We talked, about, we talked about the expenses of metal before. This is a very little bit of metal, but an extra amount of cheap, cheap wood. And when we're on the battlefield, we have to remember that mentality 
or battlefield psychology also plays a role. If you're recruiting farmer peasants to fight on a battlefield, which happened pretty frequently on their raids, which would often go from just raids of 20 or 30 guys to raids of two or 3,000 guys, and they would stay there forever, uh, you'd have to make sure that they are also comfortable on the battlefield. And it's a lot more comfortable to be this far away from your enemy than to be sword distance to your enemy. You want to make sure you're comfortable. And you know what? When we're sparring at the Swordsmanship Museum, whenever anyone pulls out an, a, a spear, it doesn't matter how skilled you are with your sword. It doesn't matter how experienced you are. You're going to go, oh, really? Because you can be as flashy or as skilled or as, or as dexterous as you can with the sword, but this thing's always going to have a huge advantage, even if that person is not very skilled. Easy enough to stab like this, but we talked about battlefield psychology. There's one aspect of battlefield psychology in the Viking arsenal that we haven't talked about yet, which is incredibly iconic. And that is the Viking shield. You cannot picture a Viking warrior without his shield. Even the Dane axemen, when they're fighting with their two-handed weapon, will have a shield slung to their back. The Viking shield is a part of the Viking arsenal. And it's also very good at making you be less scared on the battlefield because you have a literal wall to hide behind. You don't have to run back to your home and hide behind that's walls. You can have this one right here and hide behind it. This does offer a problem with spears because with two hands, you can hold the spear as far out as you'd like because you have that leverage. But now that you only have one hand to hold it in, you will have to hold it roughly in the middle to make sure it's fairly well balanced so that you can thrust and recover safely. If I were to try to do that at the end, eh, it's not very good. There is a way to make, so we, we have things that you can easily interpret. You have an underhand thrust, you have an overhand reverse thrust, you have an overhand thrust, but there's one more way to hold your spear that counteracts that lack of range. And it's actually something that knights do frequently with their lances, and footmen will do it as well. It's called couching your spear. What that means is you will take the butt end of your spear and you will tuck it up under your pit. See? Don't smell that end. But what it does is it makes your armpit act as a second leverage point. So you can hold it as far away as you can. And even if you thrust with it, your arm is in a perfect position for you to thrust. And you'll notice that the bottom of the spear is braced against my forearm. So I'm able to hold it. Not well, I'm shaking right now. But you can hold it out there long enough for you to then recover. It's a great way to maximize the reach while still having your shield. This is also very cheap. This was what most Viking warriors were armed with because most Viking warriors were farmers and poor, and they just needed to get the job done. But there's advanced versions of it. Good, I just put an obstacle right in the middle of my place. Wonderful. This right here is your next version of the Viking spear. Ignore the short shaft. It could be on whatever size shaft you wanted. Uh, this has a false history story behind it, and a true history story behind it. And the false history version, I have heard so many times, it makes me cringe. And I'm gonna tell you that false history version. Uh, and it is that these are called boar spears, incorrectly. The idea is, if you ever fight, uh, or if you've ever seen a wild boar, they're big pigs. I mean, this is why Texas is terrified of their wild boar out outbreak right now, because they're, they're monsters. They're, they're giants. They're hundreds of pounds. They've got tusks. I mean, it's like an orc. And so if you are fighting or if you're hunting a boar, which is a common thing for rich people in the Middle Ages to do, and you have a spear and you stab that orc slash boar, that animal is likely going to continue charging you in a very Uruk-hai fashion, 
up the shaft of your spear and gore you, and while you have killed the boar and you've fed your family, they will also mourn your loss. So they developed a type of spear that has uh, big old <coughs> things on the side of it that look like this uh, in order to stab that boar, hold it down in place so it cannot ride up the shaft, and someone else will take a knife or a sword or something and dispatch it. That is completely separate, and you'll hear that. You'll go to festivals, you'll go to wherever, and you'll hear that, and if you hear someone doing that, I want you to spit in their face because they don't know what they're talking about. This is referred to as a winged spear. It is separate from the boar spear despite a similar look. And I don't know about you, but if I'm on the battlefield and someone stabs me with a spear, the last thing I'm thinking about is charging up the spear shaft to attack them. So what were these used for? We have them archeologically. We know the Vikings fought with these little winged spears. They're in weapon caches and, and uh, uh, warrior graves. They're not, they're not for hunting, they're for warfare. Why? One of the best answers we can come up with is that they were used like cross guards in swords, where you'll catch your enemy spear and hold it down, hold it in place, just like you would with the boar. And then you can either step on their spear shafts to hold it in place, or maybe one of your buddies will come by and stab that person as well. You can also theoretically use it to get around your shield or your enemy's shield as well. Cool stuff. I like that. Makes sense. It's getting a little bit more advanced. We're getting a little bit more costly here. But there's one more type of spear that the Vikings had. That is your epic mercenary warrior spear. I'm going to pull that one out right now. This one, right here. I love it. It might as well be a spear on the end of a stick. Who could ask for more? Remember how I said spears were cheap because they didn't have a lot of metal? They, this one got a lot of metal. This one's expensive. Frequently, you'd actually see etchings and engravings on these spears, these big, wide spears, which are called hewing spears. Probably because the person who had one is a very successful mercenary warrior and could afford an expensive weapon like that. But the other cool thing, and I mentioned it earlier, Vikings did not have two-handed swords. But you know what a hew is? When you hew someone, you are cutting them so strongly that it goes through them or, you know, whatever. You're cutting meat or you're cutting wood or whatever. You're hewing it. So all you have to do is you have to take this hewing spear in two hands and you have yourself a two-handed sword with a very long handle. So all those techniques that you can do with a two-handed sword, you're essentially doing it with a hewing spear. This is your mercenary warrior spear. This is where you are so in tuned with being a fighter that you not only have to stab, but you can also cut with two hands. It's very cool. I like that. Epic, expensive, deadly. Question? Did they ever throw spears? There, see, I. Did they ever throw spears? It's a very good question. The answer is absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, we, when we archaeologically look at stuff, we have spearheads that are teeny, and we can theorize that they were either just a super cheap version of a spear, because all you need is a little bit of metal to puncture through whatever it is you're going to puncture through. Or we can theorize that they go on the end of a throwing spear. And you do have depictions in places like the Boyo Tapestry of spears being thrown. You also have clubs being thrown, which is hilarious. Uh, so yes, they did. What one thing that Vikings did not do that often is archery. We have a couple depictions of Viking warriors. We have one find of a longbow. Um, but it wasn't a big part of Viking culture. Vikings were very hand-to-hand -hand fighters. They weren't known for their archery. But they likely weren't known for throwing spears. Not axes. Ask me in the Q&A section. <laughs> I'm going to do a quick talk about swords, because we've got a good two minutes left. So, you can go longer. yay! <laughs>
So let's talk about swords real quick. This is what we all want, swords. Pretty cool, huh? Let me pull out one. Let me pull out a random sword. Here's a random sword right in front. This is a rough uh, Viking sword. There's a couple cool things to notice about it. One is it is a type of sword called a spatha. And the spatha are not specifically the Viking sword. Anyone that has a long-bladed, double-edged uh, sword is using a spatha. The, the Romans, the gladius is a spatha, for example. But there's another cool thing. There's a couple cool things to notice about Viking swords, Viking age swords. It's really hard to tell what swords were used by a Viking and what swords were used by a Frank or a Carolingian because they, they all use the same design. But they would always have this, or frequently have this lobed look on their pommel here. Pommel, by the way, is a good chunk of metal that acts as a counterweight so that you can swing your sword more fluidly and more easily. But there's one other thing that you want to notice about a spatha, and that is these guys here, the cross guard. Now, typically, a cross guard is to protect your hand while you're sword fighting. But if I'm gripping this thing, does that look like it's going to protect my hand very much? No, sir. No, ma'am. No way. And there's a good reason for that. Because the cross guards are less for protecting your, or for, for protecting your hands from a sword cut, but more for just keeping it in place. Because there's another thing that is meant to protect your hands. And we've talked about it before. Shield. The shield. Exactamundo. Viking sword fighting interpretation is less about how to fight with a sword and more about how to fight with a sword and shield. These Viking shields, we are very lucky because there are a lot of surviving, not a lot, a handful of surviving Viking shields. This is partially due to the fact that when Vikings would do a ship burial, they would do their normal tradition of stacking their shields on the side of the ship. And that's, this would happen when you're at sea and everyone needs to be rowing their oars or handling the mast. Or if you're doing a burial, you want to show how powerful you are, you're buried with a Viking longship and you will also line the sides with shields. So we have quite a few surviving shields. The Trelleborg shield, for example, is one of my favorite because it's one of the most well-preserved. What you see commonly with all these shields is very contradictory to what you see a lot of fighting, modern day fighting groups, Viking groups do. When you see Viking fighters nowadays on YouTube or whatever, they're always holding their shield here in front of them and they're doing this kind of like, uh, 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 just hitting each other like barbarians. And you know, they're hitting their shield, you know, and it makes a cool loud clanging noise and they're just kind of back and forthing it. And you're like, what? That doesn't jive with me archeologically. I'd say that a lot. The reason is because we have surviving Viking shields and we know that Viking shields are actually really unique. So this here is a metal piece in the middle. We got a ton of these. They're called bosses or umbos. They protect your hand. And you can see on the back, I'm just holding it loosely behind the umbo with my one hand. Archaeologically, the wood around the center, right around the umbo, is fairly, fairly thick, but it actually tapers off towards the outer rim to be as thin as a quarter inch. Quarter inch, guys. It's thinner than your pinky. I don't know about you, but if I'm in a sword fight with someone, I don't want to hold my shield like this because a simple little sword hit will break through that real easy. Well, what the heck, Vikings? Why is your shield so thin? What's going on here? Well, let's look at a few occasional Viking depictions of Vikings fighting. That happens occasionally. Uh, and there's also depictions of other warriors close to Vikings, likely influenced by their culture, that show this too. And when they are being depicted, they are not, yes, occasionally they're fighting like this. Because this is also very comforting and it gives you a good shield or a screen to prevent your opponent from seeing what you're doing. But more often than not, those Viking warriors are holding their shield like this. And you realize 
that if you're holding your shield out in front of you or up here on the side, your quarter inch thick shield with a quick rotation of your hand has now become a foot and a half thick shield, just very thin. And that makes a lot of sense. You can catch sword hits on the side of your shield all day and night because it's super thick and you don't have to worry so much about protecting your hand because this is still very protective. It's far from your hand. You can turn it sideways if you have to, if someone tries to thrust or stab at you. And so you get Vikings that likely would fight like this with their shield sideways, open, in an aggressive or even a mobile or active defense, as it's called. The Spatha, by the way, has a small hand guard to bring it back together because the Viking combat involves shield movement so much. If you have long hand guards, long cross guards, you're going to get them caught on your shield as you're moving around, and it's going to mess up your flow and your fighting. So you want a very thin cross guard so that you can use your shield more aggressively. Does that make sense? I like this archaeological discussions and analysis to interpret combat. That's what we have to do when we don't have a book like the Vikings. Does that make sense? So these Viking warriors, what happened? They were running Europe for 300 years. Huge chunks of land in England, Ireland, Scotland, Poland, down the uh, Ural River, down the Volga River, uh, and even places like Sicily or uh, Normandy were at one point under Viking control. What happened? How were these epic raiders who were so skilled at combat get defeated? Who, who took them out? What ended the Viking? Why don't we have Viking Age today? Wasn't it the Muslims? No, it was not the Muslims. Sort of. The Vikings were more than just warriors. Yes? Very good guess. The Normans actually experimented with knights. They were the proto-knights. But um, Vikings rarely came in contact with one of those early knights. The knights maybe replaced them or became the new part of the battlefield, but they didn't defeat them because they rarely came in contact with each other. The real answer is that Vikings were more than warriors. Vikings were craftsmen, artisans, and especially traders. They were skilled entrepreneurs and businessmen as much as they were warriors and raiders. They would take these beautiful things that they would create, usually from melting down the gold and silver that they stole on raids, and turn them into beautiful things like jewelry pieces. They would also trade with the... Uh, with the people who lived north of them, and I always mispronounce their name, the Sami, Sami? I always mispronounce it, I'm so sorry. Uh, but they lived in the very far north, closer to the Arctic. They had exotic skins and fur, walrus, reindeer. They would trade with them, and they would act as the middlemen selling those exotic furs and skins down to places like the Carolingian and the Byzantine Empire, eventually making it to various uh, Muslim caliphates, North Africa, and they even had trade routes extending into Eastern Asia. We have at least two different statues of the Buddha that were found in Viking warrior graves. This does not mean Vikings were Buddhist. That means that it is a sign of their wealth to have something so exotic in their treasury. They were traders. Most of Europe at this time, oh, and also they were not Christian. They were pagan, they, were within, they had their own religious beliefs. And to very, very simplify a very complicated topic, most of the people they traded with were Christian. Christians are technically not supposed to be trading with non-Christians. And so these Vikings, being businessmen, said, oh yeah, I'll totally convert, give me a discount. And that frequently happened. And you can do that. You can, you can convert, or back then, you could convert for pragmatic reasons or cynical reasons like that. But you can really only hold on to that farce for a generation or two until your kids or your grandkids or your grand-grandkids are actually Christian. 
Hey, you want to know what religion does not really support the idea of raiding religious places? <laughs> Christians, Christianity, they don't really like raiding monasteries and cathedrals. You go there as a sanctuary, not as a raiding target. And so as more and more Vikings or Scandinavians became Christian, as more and more turned converted for practical reasons or for missionary reasons or what have you, the raiding culture, which was the iconic part of the Viking Age, died out. And thus, technically, the Viking raiding culture existed for many more centuries, especially in Scotland. But the Battle of 1060, or the year 1066, Battle of Stamford Bridge, the uh, last great Viking raid, which is essentially a giant army in Anglo-Saxon England, was defeated. They scurry on back to Scandinavia, which now is less petty little kingdoms and more actual kingdoms of Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, and live their lives as normal, non-raid-centric peoples, uh, which essentially brings the Viking Age to an end. More government control, more unification culturally across Europe, uh, and less viable targets for raiding. The Viking culture still exists today, sort of. Uh, there's a lot of Viking fanboys out there, as we like to call them. Uh, folks who will shave the side of their heads uh, to imitate looking like Ragnar in that TV show with the Vikings. Uh, lots of folks will put on uh, face paint or makeup, if you make, make them look cool or more scary. Uh, they will put on Vigvisir and Agishilmar, uh, Viking, quote, 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 Viking uh, symbols, which were actually created as Christian symbols in the 1700s. Um, and it's because, I think, because we have this lack of solid history. We have this lack of diaries and day-to-day -day life and culture. We don't have any solid history. We have to work with what we have. So if you're out there and you want to research Vikings, take the hard path. Don't just take the easy path because the, the real true history, the true story of humanity and the struggles of us as a species over time are way more fascinating and way more meaningful. And with that, I will bring this presentation to a close, even though there's so much more about Viking combat that we just didn't have time for. Um, if you have future questions anytime in the future, feel free to shoot us a message either through email or Facebook or Instagram. Like us on Facebook. We've got a good following. And with that, let us give the Portage District Library a big round of applause for hosting us today. <laughs> And we're going to have a questions and answer session, too. And if you have a question, you'll raise your hand, uh, and Barb will come by with the uh, microphone. Ruth will come by with the microphone, <laughs> and, and she will let you talk into it. So who has a question for us today? Oh, we got one of It's more of a fun fact. Fun facts are my favorite. If you learn your history through memes, uh, it, uh, the Vikings weren't scared on the battlefield because they re believed in Valhalla, where when they died, they went to a place where they fought all day and feasted all night. Yeah, it's a good point. So the, the topic was Vikings weren't scared on the battlefield because part of their belief was that they would go to a place called Valhalla when they died in battle. Now, what's fascinating is that that is mentioned once in the sources that we have on Viking religion, the Poetic Eddas. They also mention quite a lot also, such as Freya, actually not uh, Thor, having first dibs on the fallen warriors in battle. Uh, and so the ones who actually go to Valhalla were the ones that Freya did not choose, and uh, Thor gets the, the rest. <laughs> so uh, again, prime example of reading more primary sources. Now, the other thing is the Poetic Eddas were written by a Christian person, so we don't even know if that's actually a unified belief. So there may very well have been many Vikings who believed that. Uh, we just don't know. This was a verbal religion. There was not like a tome 
There was not a religious book, but that is a very fascinating fact and lots of theories about why Vikings were so powerful and not scared on the battlefield, and that is one very big contributing factor. Good job, thank you. Couple of questions. Um, years ago, they had the this, this movies of the Spartans. Oh boy. <laughs> and I'm just wondering, it, the Spartans were obviously warriors the, in depicted in the movie, they started out as children and they basically fought their neighbors, brothers, till they were grown men and then they would go out and, and fight as warriors professionally. Mm -hmm. And you're saying the Vikings were farmers, so they did not or might not have had the training necessary, but they obviously learned it at some point in time or utilized the skills they had with the t implements they had to do the job necessary. So they were not growing up as warriors from a young age like the Spartans may have been. Is this? They, we unfortunately, even in the sagas, don't have a lot of information. It's a very good question because I'd love to know that myself. Uh, there are, there's no information of uh, Snorri starting his combat training at the age of seven or something like that. We just don't have that information. Um, we do have, archaeologically, I like that word, we do have a couple small wood swords that we have found. Small as in child-sized. So theoretically, they could have been practicing at that, uh, that age. It could have also been a toy. You know, I've got, I had some swords when I was a kid. Uh, doesn't, doesn't mean I started training when I was five. But we do have, and I, I have a second Viking lecture that's called uh, Viking Warrior Societies. Maybe we'll bring it back. Um, and one of the Viking Warrior Societies is a group called the Yom's Viking, which there is uh, mentioned in a couple sagas. And they do say that there is an age limit on, the Vi on, on membership in the Yom's Vikings. And I believe, I believe it was 16. Uh, but there is an account of one Yams Viking who was admitted earlier than that. And the Yams Vikings, I should clarify, are a mercenary group. They are a skilled, trained mercenary group who participate in lots of battles. Um, didn't last very long. <laughs> I think it was about 80 years total that they existed. But uh, did the young soldier, warrior, mercenary be admitted into this proto-brotherhood because he was a good fighter? Or was it because he was a, a Jarl or a king's son and they just wanted to stay on good relations with the nobility? We don't know. And uh, it could be a lot of things. The important thing is that we stay vigilant to the history and not fill in the gaps with what we would love to see. But we could actually go into a lot. There's, in Europe, there's just archives and archives and archives and archives of documents, maybe not that far back, but have yet to be explored because it costs a lot of time and money to get them, to translate them, to understand the meaning, to keep them preserved. That's why we have to support grants and grant writing so that these nonprofits can go out there and you know, spend the hours and hours and hours and hours it takes to translate these things. It's a very good question. I wish I had a more precise answer for you, but I don't. Did that answer it? Awesome, cool stuff. Another question. Sorry, I'm pointing with my sword. I'm really sorry if that's off-putting. <laughs> uh, you talked about the mercenaries. Um, mm -hmm. Who hired them? Were the people who were being raided uh, get these mercenaries to protect them, or how did they, you know, how, how did they become who they were, like mercenaries? That's a very good question. Uh, I think it started actually because, the, as I mentioned earlier, the Viking raids raids grew from small groups of people to literal armies with hundreds of ships crossing the ocean. And you actually get uh, besiegements of large cities. The Siege of Paris is the prime example. This is Paris, France. Huge city at the time. And the Vikings surrounded it and besieged it, meaning they wouldn't let anyone in or out. They wouldn't let food in or out. And they basically were holding the entire population of this city hostage with the hopes of getting payment to leave. And frequently, that was a common tactic where you would hold cities or settlements hostage, and instead of killing anyone and risking your own lives, you just take the money that you were there for in the first place uh, and, and leave without any conflict. Frequently, this developed where the mainland European nobility would use their brains and say, hey, I see you're on our land. 
you're probably coming to besiege my hometown. How about this? How about I give you these 200 acres, all of this money, and you guys, instead of, you know, killing us and raiding our towns, why don't you settle here? Why don't you become part of us? Or better yet, why don't you just leave off and become your own nation? And that's how Normandy actually started. It started as a Viking raid where uh, the king of Francia said, hey, take this land and blank off. You know, deal with, don't, don't, don't muck with us. And they said, sure. And they became their own nation, independent. Uh, and that happened occasionally. You get that with Sicily as well. And it's just, here, take this land. We don't care about it. Don't kill us. And that grew and grew to having relationships with Viking settlements. And these, these kings and queens would be hiring, or dukes or duchesses or whatever, nobility happened to be going at war, going to war, would be uh, fortifying their own military forces with these Vikings that they already had relationships with. Remember, the goal of Vikings is just to get money. Is it trading? Is it raiding? Is it selling yourself as a warrior? Whatever it might be, they will get their gold. That's a very good question, and it's mostly speculative. We don't have you know, the, the account of a, a Viking mercenary force and how they grew. That's a very good question. So it's good to use the terror against your enemies rather than against yourself. OK, so we're going to do two more questions. I got one here and one there. After a raid, would the Vikings fight each other for the wealth? That is a very, very good question. And I, as, as, as enthralling and intriguing as the topic of Viking diplomacy is, uh, there was almost a bit of a companionship, if you will. Because you're right, I did earlier say that there were different minor kingdoms or minor chieftains. Uh, and they, there was a lot of infighting between Viking groups, but it wasn't usually over the raiding material uh, because wealth in Scandinavia, rather than hidden away in a cathedral, was wealth for everyone. Not, not in a like, communist brotherhood way, but it was wealth for that region rather than for in some distant town. Uh, they also did have political units like things, literally thing, T-H-I-N-G. It was their polit there was a, the early Viking political gathering and everyone was involved with it, every chieftain. So you often wanted to maintain good relationships with your neighbors so that you would have either support or alliances politically during the, the thing meeting. Good question. Uh, I just want to say, um, in the movie like Brave, the Disney, Disney movie, that the Scottish king like had like a, their own kingdom and like king and queen and mm -hmm. just then hunting and such. Did that ever happen in real life? So uh, you bring up a good point. That's a topic of Vikings or pseudo Vikings in media, TV. Uh, there's a to start a, a very wide, broad thing, you see it in movies like Brave, you see it in movies like How to Train Your Dragon, this kind of weird pseudo-Viking, pseudo-Scottish culture that does not really part of a particular time or era. Um, for example, Scottish kilts didn't really pop up until the 1600s, about 600 years after the Viking Age, but they use them very frequently in Brave, and they don't really have a set era in Brave. I can't watch that movie without going, oh, that's based on this find from the 1200s, but that's based, I, I can't, don't watch a movie with me, you'll hate it. Uh, I, there, are, there are plenty of stories like that. The sagas are full of this kind of like Game of Thrones style intrigue between this family and that family, uh, to the point where you're reading it, you're like, this is fiction. There's no way this happened. Um, which is why we take the sagas with a big grain of salt. So it, it certainly could have happened. Tribute was a very, or, or uh, dowries, meaning gifts that you give with marriage and political marriages, certainly happened, certainly did happen. Um, but we don't have a lot of very good examples of it. However, if you like that concept, I might recommend looking into Scottish and Irish history where clan warfare was actually incredibly popular for centuries. 16th century Scotland and Ireland, and even 15th century, 
There's tons of that with the different families and the different clans, more so than the Vikings. It's a good place to look into. Plenty of works and documents on that. It's cool, great question, great question. Wow, we didn't even talk about like women Viking warriors. Oh, yeah. I was waiting for that question. Maybe, <laughs> maybe next time. Now you're all curious, I'm not gonna talk about it. <laughs> so if you wanna know about Viking warrior women, then maybe you will go and fill out a survey. Let us know that you enjoyed it tonight. Uh, and then uh, Jerry, we'll have you back all the time, man. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. really enjoyed this. Will we all give Jerry a hand, please? Thank you everyone for coming out tonight and staying even later than what we had advertised. So we do appreciate that and you all have a good night.